Good morrow, scholars. Welcome back to Life and Death Twilight Reimagined. Chapter 17, page 272. Today, for no reason, I've decided to read this as Batman. Because it's Halloween. I guess that's the reason. I'm a horrible Batman, just remember that for when the live stream happens. I may not use this voice for the whole reading, but also I might try and use it for the entirety of the, uh live stream so look forward to that or kill me I don't know it was just beginning to rain when Edith turned onto my street up until that moment I had no doubt that she'd been staying with me while I spent a few hours in the real world and then I saw the black withered sedan parked in Charlie's driveway and heard Edith mut mutter something angry under her breath leaning away from the rain under the shallow front porch Jules Black stood behind her mother's wheelchair Bonnie's face was impassive as rock while Edith parked my truck against the curb. Jules stared down looking mortified. Edith's low voice was furious. This is crossing the line. She came to warn Charlie, I guess, more hor horrified than angry. Edith just nodded, answering Bonnie's stare with narrowed eyes. At least Charlie wasn't home yet. Maybe the disaster could be, the disaster could be averted. Let me deal with this, I suggested. Edith's glare looked a little too serious. I was surprised that she agreed. That's probably best. Be careful, though. The child has no idea. Child? You know Jules. You know Jules is not is not that much younger than I am. She looked at me then, her anger gone. She grinned. Oh, I know. I sighed. Get them inside so I can leave, she told me. I'll be back around dusk. You can take the truck, I offered. She rolled her eyes. I could walk home faster than this truck moves. I didn't want to leave her. You don't have to go. She touched my frown and smiled. Actually, I do. After you get rid of them, she glared at the Black's directions. That's racist. You still have to prepare Charlie to meet your new girlfriend. She laughed at my face. I guess I could see exactly how excited she could see exactly how excited I was for that. At least Batman doesn't have to deal with that. It wasn't that I didn't want Charlie to know about Edith. I knew he liked the Cullens and how he how could he not like Edith? He'd probably be insultingly impressed. But it just seemed like pushing my luck, trying to drag this too beautiful fantasy down into the sludge of boring, ordinary life didn't feel safe. How could the two coexist for long? I'll be back soon, she promised. Her eyes flickered over to the porch, and then she darted in swiftly to press her lips on the side of my neck. My heart bounced around inside my ribs while I, too, glanced at the porch. Bonnie's face was no longer impassive, and her hands clutched at the armrests of her chair. Soon, I said as I opened my door and stepped out into the rain. I could feel her eyes on my back as I jogged to the porch. Hey, Jules. Hi, Bonnie. I greeted them as cheerfully as I could manage. Charlie's gone for the day. I hope you haven't been waiting long. Not long, Bonnie said in a subdued tone. Her dark eyes were piercing. I just wanted to bring this up. She gestured to a brown paper sack resting on her lap. Thanks, I said automatically, though I had no idea what it could be. Why don't you come in for a minute and dry off? I pretended I didn't notice her intense scrutiny as I unlocked the door and waved them inside ahead of me. Jules gave me a half-smile as she walked by. Let me take that, I offered as I turned to shut the door. I exchanged one last look with Edith. With Edith. She was perfectly still as she waited, her eyes serious. You'll want to put that in the fridge, Bonnie instructed as she handed me the package. It's a batch of Holly Clearwater's homemade fish fry, Charlie's favorite. The fridge keeps it drier. Thanks, I repeated with more emotion. I was running out of ways to cook fish, and he's bound to bring more home tonight. Fishing again? Bonnie asked. She was suddenly intent. Down at the usual spot? Maybe I'll run by and see him. No, I lied quickly. He was headed someplace new, but I have no idea where. She stared at my face, her eyes narrowing. It was always so obvious when I tried to lie. Julie, she said, still eyeing me. Why don't you go get that new picture of Aaron out of the car? I'll leave that for Charlie, too. Where is it? Jules asked. Her voice sounded kind of down. I glanced at her, but she was staring at the door, her black brows pulling together. I think I saw it in the trunk, Bonnie said. You may have to dig for it. Jules stalked back out into the rain. Bonnie and I faced each other in silence. After a few seconds, the quiet started to feel awkward, so I turned and headed to the kitchen. I could hear her wet wheels squeak against the linoleum as she followed. Okay, you know what? That's enough. Hang on one sec. This is going to take a minute. <laughs> Good practice, though.
Terribly sorry. Whew, gets hot in there. Maybe I should have just dressed up as the Joker. I think I still have the shirt. Oh well, anyway, back to reading. Yeah. Where was I? Bonnie and I faced each other in silence. After a few seconds, the quiet started to feel awkward, so I turned and headed to the kitchen. I could hear her wet wheels squeaking. Okay. Linoleum. There we go. See? I can say it. I fit the paper bag into the space on top of the shelf of the fridge and then turned slowly to meet the eyes uh, I could feel boring into me. Charlie won't be back for a long time. My voice was almost rude. She nodded in agreement but said nothing. Thanks again for the fish fry, I hinted. She continued nodding. I sighed and leaned back against the counter. Bo, she said, and then she hesitated. I waited. Bo, she said again. Charlie is one of my best friends. Yes. She spoke each word carefully in her deep voice. I noticed you've been spending time with one of the Cullens. Yes, I repeated. Her eyes narrowed again. Maybe it's none of my business, but I don't think it's such a good idea. You're right, I agreed. It is none of your business. She raised her thick eyebrows at my tone. You probably don't know this, but the Cullen family has an unpleasant reputation on the reservation. Actually, I did know that, I said in a hard voice. She looked surprised. But that reputation couldn't be deserved, could it? Because the Cullens never set foot on the reservation, do they? I could feel that my less than subtle reminder of the agreement uh, that both bound and protected her tribe pulled her up short. That's true, she agreed, her eyes guarded. You seem well informed about the Cullens, more informed than I expected. I stared her down, maybe even better informed than you are. Kids these days. I used to like Bo, not anymore. She pursed her thick lips as she considered that. Maybe, she allowed, but her eyes were shrewd. Is Charlie as well informed? She found the weak spot in my armor. Charlie likes the Cullens a lot, I said. She obviously understood my evasion. Her expression was unhappy, but not surprised. It's none of my business, she said, but it may be Charlie's. Though it would be my business again, whether or not I think that's Charlie's business, right? I wondered if she even understood my confused question as I struggled not to say anything compromising, but she seemed to. She thought about it while the rain picked up against the roof. The only sound breaking the silence yes she finally surrendered I guess that's your business too I sighed with relief thanks Bonnie just think about what you're doing Bo she urged okay I agreed quickly she frowned what I meant to say was don't do what you're doing She. Lo I looked into her eyes filled only with concern for me and there was nothing I could say the front door banged loudly there's no picture anywhere in that car Jules complaining voice reached us before she did she rounded the corner the shoulders of her t-shirt were stained with the rain, her long hair dripping. Hmm, Bonnie grunted, suddenly detached, spinning her chair around to face her daughter. I guess I left it at home. Jules just rolled her eyes dramatically. Great. Well, Bo, tell Charlie, She paused. Bonnie paused before continuing, that we stop by, I mean. I will, I muttered. Oh my goodness. Jules was surprised. Are we leaving already? Charlie's going to be out late, Bonnie explained as she rolled herself past Jules. Oh, Jules looked disappointed. Well, I guess I'll see you later then, Bo. Sure, I agreed. Take care, Bonnie warned me, but I didn't answer. Jules helped her mother out of the door. I waved briefly, glancing swiftly toward my now empty truck, and then shut the door before they were gone. And then I had nothing to do but wait. After a few seconds staring at the empty kitchen, I sighed and started cleaning. At least it was... At least it kept my hands busy, not so much my thoughts, now that I was away from Jesse Mead's mood fix. I was able to really stress out about what I was about what I'd agreed to. But how hard could it be? Edith said I wouldn't have to play if I tried to convince myself that it would I tried to convince myself it would be fine while scrubbing just a little too hard. I was just finishing the bathroom when I finally heard Charlie's car in the driveway. I stacked the cleaning supplies in alphabetical order under the sink while listening to him come in through the door. He started banging around under the stairs, stowing his tackle. Oh, right. The little box fish. Never mind. Bo, he called. Hey, Dad, I yelled back. When I got downstairs, he was scrubbing his hands in the kitchen sink. Where's the fish, I asked. Out in the deep freeze. I'll go grab a couple while they're fresh. Bonnie dropped off some of Holly Clearwater's fr fish fry for this afternoon. I tried to sound enthusiastic. She did? Shirley's eyes lit up. That's my favorite. Where was I? Oh, Charlie cleaned up while I got dinner ready. 
It wasn't that long before we were both at the table eating in silence. Charlie was obviously enjoying the food, and I, I was wondering how on earth I was supposed to broach the subject of my new girlfriend. What did you do with yourself today? He asked, snapping me out of my thoughts. Well, this afternoon I just hung out around the house. Only the very recent part of this afternoon. Actually, I tried to keep my voice upbeat, but my stomach was hollow. And this morning I was over at the Cullens. Charlie dropped his fork. Dr. Cullen's place? He asked in, in astonishment. There we go. I pretended not to notice his reaction. Yeah, what were you doing there? He hadn't picked his fork back up. Well, I sort of have a date with Edith Cullen tonight, and she wanted to introduce me to her parents. He stared at me like I'd announced that I'd spent the day knocking over liquor stores. What? Dad, didn't you just tell me how you wanted me to socialize? He blinked a few times and picked up his fork. Yeah, I guess I did. He took another bite, chewed slowly, and swallowed. And didn't you just tell me that none of the girls in town are your type? I didn't say that. You did. Don't get touchy with me, kid. You know what I mean. Why didn't you say something? Was I being too nosy? No, Dad. It's just... This is all kind of new, okay? I didn't want to jinx it. Huh. He reflected for a minute while he ate another bite. So you went to meet her folks, eh? Er, yeah. I mean, I already knew Dr. Cullen, but I got to meet her father. Ernest Cullen is great. Quiet, but very... Kind, I guess is the best word for it. I'm having such a hard time turning the page with these. There's something about him. Yeah, I noticed that. Meeting the parents, though, isn't that kind of serious? Does that mean she's your girlfriend? Yeah, this wasn't as hard as I thought it would be. I felt a strange sense of pride. I was able to claim her this way. I have a problem with that. Let's see, where was I? kind of neanderthal of me but there it was well at least he's aware yeah she's my girlfriend wow you're telling me do i get a visit too i waste ways raised one eyebrow will you be on your best behavior he lifted both hands what me have i ever embarrassed you before have i ever brought a girl over before he huffed and changed the subject when are you picking her up no oh, she's meeting me here see you do get a visit she'll probably be here soon actually where are you taking her? Well, I guess the plan is that we're going to play baseball with her family. Charlie stared at me for one second, and then he busted up. I rolled my eyes and waited for him to finish. Eventually, he pretended to wipe tears out of his eyes. I have you're getting that out of your system now. Baseball, huh? You must really like this girl. I thought about just shrugging that off, but I figured he'd see through me anyway. Yeah, I said. I really do. I heard an unfamiliar engine roar up to the house, and I looked up in surprise. That her? Maybe... After a few seconds, the doorbell rang, and Charlie jumped up. I ran around him and beat him to the door. Pushy much, he uttered under his breath. I don't feel like Charlie would say something like that. Also, Batman. I hadn't realized how hard it was pouring outside. Edith stood in the halo of the porch light, uh, looking like a model in an ad for raincoats. I heard Charlie's breath catch in surprise. I wondered if he'd ever seen her up close before. It was kind of unnerving. Even when you were used to it, I just stared at her, gobsmacked. I've never heard that word before. Actually, no, I've heard it once. She laughed. Can I come in? Yeah, of course. I jumped back out of her way, knocking into Charlie in the process. After a few seconds of bumbling around, I had her jacket hung up and had both her and Charlie sitting down in the living room. She was in the armchair, so I went to sit next to Charlie on the sofa. So, Edith, how are your parents? Excellent, thank you, Chief Swan. You can, uh, you can call me Charlie. I'm off the clock. Thanks, Charlie. She only unleashed the dimples and his face went blank it took him a second to recover so um you're playing baseball tonight it didn't seem to occur to either of them that the buckets of water falling out of the sky right now could impact these plans only in washington yes hopefully Bo doesn't mind hanging out with my family too much charlie jumped in before i could respond i'd say it was the baseball he'd mind more they both laughed i shot my dad a look where was the best behavior i'd been promised that was probably it Should we be on our way, I suggested. We're not in any hurry, Edith said with a grin. I hit Charlie with my elbow. Edith's smile got wider. Oh, uh, yeah, Charlie said. You kids go ahead. I've got a bunch of stuff to get to. Edith was on her feet in a fluid movement. It was lovely to see you, Charlie. Yes, you come visit any time, Edith. Thank you, you're very kind. Charlie ran a hand through his hair so consciously. I also do that. I didn't think I'd ever seen him so flustered. Will you kids be out super late? I looked at her. No, we'll be reasonable. Don't wait up, though, I added. 
I handed her coat to her and then held the door. As she passed, Charlie gave me a wide-eyed look. I shrugged my shoulders and raised my eyebrows. I didn't know how I'd gotten so lucky either. I followed her out into the porch, then stopped dead. There behind my truck was a monster jeep. Its tires was, were as high as my waist. There were metal guards all, all over the headlights and tail lights, and four large spotlights attached to the crash bar. The hardtop was shiny red. Charlie let out a low whistle. Wear your seatbelts. I don't know how to whistle. Wheat woo, I guess. I went to the driver's side of the. Uh, I went to the driver's side to get the door for Edith. She was inside in one sufficient leap. Though I had, I was glad there were. Th we were on the far side of the jeep from Charlie because it didn't look entirely natural. I went to m my side and climbed gracelessly into my seat. She had the engine running now, and I recognized the roar that had surprised me earlier. It wasn't as loud as my truck, but it sounded a lot more brawny. Oh, you can't see my... F Never mind, I'm stupid. Hey. Doing a recording. Say hi. Do you do that on purpose, or is it just a natural reaction? I'd just like to point out, I started this in full costume. I think I'm going to start taking parts off. Not like that, shut up. <laughs> so that this is a little easier. No, I just, I couldn't breathe. Oh. Also, I'm having a hard time turning the page. Where was I? Sorry, guys. And girls, I don't know. Out of habit, she wasn't going to start driving until I buckled in. I reached for my seatbelt. Uh, what? Or er, what's all this? How do I... Off-roading harness, she explained. Um... I tried to find all the right connectors, but it wasn't going too fast, and then her hands were there, flashing around at a barely visible speed, and gone again. I was glad the rain was too thick to see uh, Charlie's face, or Charlie clearly on the porch, because that meant he couldn't see me entirely either. Uh, thanks. You're welcome. I knew better than to ask if she was going to put her own harness on, too. She pulled away from the house. This is, uh, a large jeep you have. It's Eleanor's. She let me borrow it so we wouldn't have to run the whole way. Where do you keep where do you keep this thing? We re remodeled one of the building or the outbuildings into a garage. Suddenly her first answer sank in. Wait, run the whole way? As in we're still going to run part of the way? I demanded. She pursed her lips like she was trying not to smile. You're not going to run. I groaned. I'm going to puke in front of your family. Keep your eyes closed. You'll be fine. I shook my head, sighed, and then reached over and took her hand. Hi, I missed you. She laughed. It was a thrilling sound, not quite human. I miss you, too. Isn't that strange? Why strange? You'd think I'd have learned more patience over the last 100 years, and here I am finding it difficult to pass an afternoon without you. I'm glad it's not just me. She leaned over to swiftly kiss my cheek, then pulled back quickly inside. You smell even better in the rain. In a good way or a bad way? She frowned. Always both. Always both? I can't believe I actually said that. I don't know how she even knew where we were going with the downpour. It was like a liquid gray curtain around the jeep, but she somehow found a side road that was more or less a mountain path. For a long while, conversation was impossible because I was bouncing up and down on the seat like a jackhammer. She seemed to enjoy the ride, though, smiling hugely the whole way. And then we came to the end of the road. The trees formed green walls on three sides of the jeep. The rain was a mere drizzle, slowing every second, the uh, sky brighter through the clouds. Sorry, Bo, we have to go on foot from here. You know what? I'll just wait here. What happened to all your courage? You were extraordinary this morning. I haven't forgotten the last time yet. Was it really only yesterday? She was around up to my side of the car in a blur, and she started on the harness. I'll get loose. You go on ahead, I protested. She was finished before I got the first few words out. I sat in the car looking at her. You don't trust me, she asked. Hurt, or pretending to be hurt, I thought. That really isn't the issue. Trust and motion sickness have zero relationship to each other. She looked at me for a minute, and I felt pretty stupid for sitting there in the Jeep, but all I could think about was the most sickening roller coaster ride I'd ever been on. Do you remember what I was saying about mind over matter, she asked. Yes. Maybe if you concentrated on something else. Like what? Suddenly she was in the Jeep with me, one knee on the seat next to my leg, her hands on my shoulders. Her face was only inches away. I had a light heart attack. Keep breathing, she told me. How? 
She smiled and then her face was serious again. When we're running, and yes, that part is non-negotiable, I want you to concentrate on this. Slowly she moved in closer, turning her face to the side so that we were cheek to cheek, her lips at my ear. One of her hands slid down to my chest, to my waist. What? Just remember us like this. I am feeling awkward. Her lips pulled away, uh, pulled softly on my earlobe. What? Then moved slowly across my jaw and down my neck. Breathe, Bo. I can't help but think of the one scene in uh, The Dark Knight Returns Part 2 with the Joker when he saw, after he's killed his uh, uh, psychiatrist. The Joker, that is. Should I wear this costume while also dressed as the Joker from the neck up? Let me know. I sucked in a loud lungful. She kissed under the edge of my jaw and then along my cheekbones. Still worried? Huh? She chuckled. Her hands were holding my face now and she lightly kissed one eyelid and then the next. Edith, I breathed. Then her lips were on mine, and they weren't quite as gentle and cautious as they always had been before. They moved urgently, cold and unyielding, and, and though I knew better, I couldn't think coherently enough to make good decisions. I didn't consciously tell my hands to move, but my arms were wrapped around her waist, trying to pull her closer. My mouth moved with hers, and I was gasping for air, gasping in her scent with every breath. Curses, bow. And then she was gone, slithering easily out of my grasp, already standing ten feet away outside of the car by the time I blinked my way back to reality. Sorry, I guess. She stared warily at me with her eyes so wide, so the white showed all the way around the gold. I half fell awkwardly from the car, then took a step toward her. I truly do think you'll be the death of me, Bo, she said quietly. I froze. What? She took a deep breath, and then she was right next to me. Let's get out of here before I do something really stupid, she muttered. She turned her back to me, uh, staring back over her shoulder with a get-on-with-it look. And how was, uh, how was I supposed to reject her now, feeling like a gorilla again, only even more ridiculous than before? I climbed onto her back. Keep your eyes shut, she warned, and then she was off. I forced my eyes closed, trying not to think about the speed of the wind that was pushing the, so the skin against my skull. Wait. Other than that... Other than that, Till, it was hard to believe we were really flying through the forest like we had before. The motion of her body was so smooth, I would have thought she was just strolling down the sidewalk with a gorilla on her back. Her breath came and went evenly. I wasn't entirely sure we had stopped when she reached back and touched my face. It's over, Bo. I opened my eyes and sure enough, we were at a standstill. In my hurry to get off of her, I lost my balance. She turned just in time to watch as I, arms windmilling, windmilling wildly, fell hard onto my butt. I'd do that also. For a second she stared like she wasn't sure if uh, she was still too mad to find me funny, but then she must have decided that she was not too mad. She burst into long peals of laughter, throwing her head back and holding her arms across her stomach. I got up slowly and brushed the mud and weeds off of my back, on the, off the back of my jeans the best I could while she kept laughing. You know, it would probably be more humane for you to just dump me now, I said glumly. That's not going to get any easier for me over time. She took a few deep breaths, trying to get control of herself. I sighed and started walking in the most path-like direction I could see. Something caught the back of my sweater, and I smiled. I looked over my shoulder. She had a fistful of sweater, the same way she'd grabbed me outside the nurse's office. Where are you going, Bo? Wasn't there a baseball game happening? It's the other way. I pivoted. Okay. She took my hand, and we started walking slowly toward a dark patch of... Uh, Toward a dark patch of forest. There we go. I'm sorry I laughed. I would have laughed at me too. No, I was just a little agitated. I needed the catharsis. There we go. We walked silently for a few seconds. At least tell me it worked. Mind over matter. The mind over matter experiment. Well, I didn't get sick. Good, but I wasn't thinking about in the car. I was thinking about after. She didn't say anything. I know I, are, I know I already apologized, but sorry, again, I will learn how to do better, I know. Bo, stop, please, you make me feel even more guilty when you apologize. I looked down at her, we'd both stopped walking, why should you feel guilty? She laughed again, but this time there was almost uh, an almost hysterical edge to her laugh. Oh, indeed, why should I feel guilty? 
The darkness in her eyes made me anxious. There was pain there, and I didn't know how to make it better. I put my hand against her cheek. Edith, I don't understand what you're saying. She closed her eyes. I just can't seem to stop putting you in danger. I think I'm in control of myself, and then it gets so close. I don't know how not to be this anymore. I still close. She gestured to herself. My very existence put you at, puts you at risk. Sometimes I truly hate myself. I should be stronger. I should be able to. I moved my hand to cover her mouth. Stop. Her eyes opened. She peeled my hand off her mouth and placed it over her cheek again. I love you, she said. It's a poor excuse for what I'm doing, but it's still true. It was the first time she'd ever said she loved me in so many words. Like she said this morning, it was different hearing the words out loud. I love you, I told her when I'd caught my breath. I don't want you to be anything other than what you are. She sighed. Now be a good boy, she said, and stretched me up on her, uh, and stretched up on her tiptoes, rather. I held very still while she brushed her lips softly against mine. We stared at each other for a minute. Baseball, she asked. Baseball. I agreed much more confidently than I felt. She took my hand and led me a few feet uh, through the tall ferns and around a massive hemlock tree. Don't eat that. And we were suddenly there on the edge of an enormous clearing on the side of a mountain. It's twice the size of any baseball stadium. All of the others were there. Ernest, Eleanor, and Royal were all sitting on the outcropping of a rock, maybe a hundred yards away. Much farther out, I could see Jessamine and Archie standing at least a quarter of a mile apart. It was almost like they were pantomiming playing catch. I never saw any ball. It looked like Karin was making bases, but that couldn't be right. The points were much too far apart. When she walked into view, the three uh, on the rock stood. Ernest uh, sta started towards us. Royal walked away toward where Karin was setting up. Eleanor followed Ernest after a long look at Royal's back. I was staring at Royal's back, too. It made me nervous. Was that you we heard before, Edith? Ernest asked. Sounded like a hyena choking to death, Eleanor added. I smiled tentatively at Ernest. That that was her. Bo was being funny, Edith explained. Archie had left uh, off his game of catch and was running towards us. It was like his feet never touched the ground. In half a heartbeat, he was there, uh, hurtling to, to a stop right in front of us. It's time, he announced. The second he spoke, a deep rumble of thunder in the... Uh, shook the forest behind us and then crashed w westwards toward the town eerie isn't it uh, Eleanor said to me when I turned to look at her surprised she was so casual with me she winked let's go Archie took Eleanor's hand and they darted toward the oversized diamond Archie almost bounded like a stag but closer to the ground what Eleanor was just as fast and nearly as graceful but something altogether different something that charged not bounded like a boar? Are you ready for some ball? Edith asked, her eyes bright. It was impossible not to be enthusiastic about something that clearly made her happy. Go team! What? That's the best I'd be able to do, too. She laughed quickly, ran her fingers through my hair, then raced off after the other two. Her run was more aggressive than either of the others, like a cheetah to a gazelle, but still supple and heartbreakingly beautiful. She quickly caught up and then passed the others. Shall we go watch? Ernest asked in his soft tenor voice. Whoop. I don't know how that happened. I realized that I was staring open mouth after them. I quickly reassembled my expression and nodded. Ernest kept a few feet farther away than was exactly normal for two people walking together. And I figured he was still being careful not to frighten me. He matched his stride to mine without seeming impatient at the pace. You don't play with them? I asked. No, I prefer to referee. I like keeping them honest. Do they cheat? Oh, yes. And you should see hear the arguments they get into. Actually, I hope you don't. You would think they were raised by a pack of wolves. Wink, wink. You sound like my dad, I laughed. He laughed, too. Well, I do think of them as my children in most ways. I could never get over. He broke off and then took a deep breath. Did Edith tell you I lost my daughter? Uh, no, I murmured, stunned, scrambling to understand what lifetime he was remembering. My only child, my Grace. She died when she was barely two. It broke my heart, and that's why I jumped off the cliff, you know, he added calmly. Oh, um, Edith just said you fell. Always so polite, Ernest smiled. Edith was the first of my new children, my second daughter. 
I've always thought of her that way, though. She's older than I. In at least, uh, in one way at least, and I wondered if my grace would have grown into such an amazing person. He looked at me and smiled warmly. I'm so happy she's found you, Bo. She's been the odd man out for so far too long. It's hurt me to see her alone. You don't mind, then? I asked, hesitant again. That I'm all wrong for her? No, he said thoughtfully. You're what she wants. It will all work out somehow. But his forehead creased with worry. Another peal of thunder began. Ernest stopped then. Apparently we'd reached the edge of the field. It looked as if the, they had formed teams. Edith was far out in left field. Kareen stood between the first and second bases, and Archie held the ball, position on the spot that must be the pitcher's mound. Eleanor was swinging an alum a aluminum bat, because I'm stupid. Where was I? Where's the bat? There it is. It whistled almost untraceably through the air. I waited for her to approach the home plate, but then I realized, as she leaned into her stance, that she was already there, farther from the pitcher's mound than I could have, would have thought possible. Jessamine stood several feet behind her, catching uh, for the other team. Of course, none of them had gloves. All right, Ernest called in a clear voice, which I guess even Edith would hear as far out as she was. Batter up! Archie stood straight, still as a statue. His style seemed to be stealth. Uh, rather than an intimidating wind-up. He held the ball in both hands at his waist, and then, like a strike of a cobra, his right hand flicked out and the ball smacked into Jesse Mean's hand without a, with a sound like a gunshot. Was that a strike? I whispered to Ernest. If they don't hit it, it's a strike, he told me. Jesse Mean hurled the ball back to Archie's waiting hand. He permitted himself a brief grin, and then his hand spun out again. This time, the bat somehow made it around in time to smash into the invisible ball. That's a horrible superhero name. The crack of impact was shattering, thunderous. It echoed off the mountainside. I imme immediately understood the need for the storm. I was barely able to follow the ball, shooting like a m meteor above the field, flying deep into the surrounding forest. Home run, I muttered. Wait, Ernest said. He was listening intently, one hand raised. Eleanor was just a blur around the bases, carrying, shadowing her. I realized Edith was missing. Out, Ernest cried. I stared in disbelief as Edith sprang from the fridge of the trees. Fringe of the trees, fridge. A ball in her upraised hand, her wide grin, visible even to me. Eleanor hits the hardest, Ernest explained, but Edith runs the fastest. Everyone has to have their talents. I just haven't found mine yet. It's like watching superheroes play, which is actually a lot of fun. Uh, go watch the episode of Batman the Brave and the Bold where they actually play baseball with the villains. It was impossible to keep up with the speed at which the ball flew, the rate at which their bodies raced around the field. I learned the other reason they waited for a thunderstorm to play when Jessamine trying to avoid Edith's infallible, there we go, yeah, infallible, I don't know why I struggled with that word, fielding hit a ground ball toward Karin. Karin ran into the ball and then raced Jessamine to first base. When they collided, the sound was like a crash of two massive falling boulders. I jumped up, afraid someone would be hurt, but they were both totally fine. Safe, Ernest called in a calm voice. Eleanor's team was up by one. Royal managed to tear around the bases after tagging up one of Eleanor's long flies. When Edith caught the third out, she sprinted to my side, beaming with excitement. What do you think, she asked. One thing's for sure, I'll never be able to sit through a dull old Major League game baseball, or Major League Baseball game again. I am so dumb. I haven't eaten today, so bear with me. And it sounds like you did uh, so much of that before she left. I am a little disappointed, I tease. Why? Well, it would be nice if I could find just one thing you didn't do better than everyone else on the planet. She flashed her dimples, leaving me breathless. I'm up, she said, heading for the plate. She played intelligently, keeping the ball low, out of reach of Royal's always ready hand in the outfield, gaining two bases like lightning before Eleanor could get the ball back in play. Karin knocked one out so far out of the field with a boom that hurt my ears that she and Edith both made it in. Archie slapped them high fives. The score constantly changed as the game continued, and they razzed each other like street ball players as they took turns with the lead. Occas occasionally, what? Ernest would call them to order. The thunder rumbled on, but we stayed dry as Archie had predicted. Karin was up at bat, Edith catching when Archie suddenly gasped. My eyes were on Edith as usual, but I saw her head snap up to look at him. <coughs> the 
Their eyes met, and something flowed between them in half a second. She was at my side before the others could ask Archie what was wrong. Archie? Ernest asked, tense. I didn't see, Archie whispered. I couldn't tell. They were all gathered in now. Karine was calm, authoritative. What is it, Archie? They were traveling much quicker than I thought, and I can see I had the perspective all wrong before, he murmured. Jessamine put her arm around him, her posture protective. What changed, she asked. They heard us playing, and it changed their path, Archie said, contrite as if he felt responsible for whatever happened. Seven pairs of eyes flashed into my face and away. How soon, Karin asked. A look of intense concentration crossed his face. Less than five minutes. They're running. They want to play. He scowled. Can you make it? Karin asked Edith, her eyes flicking toward me again. No, not caring. She cuts so short. Besides, the last thing we need is for them to catch the scent and start hunting. How many? Eleanor asked Archie. Three. Three, she scoffed. Let them come. The long bands of muscle flexed down her arm. For a split second, that seemed much longer than it really was. Karin uh, deliberated. Only Eleanor seemed relaxed. The rest stared at Karin's face, obviously anxious. Let's just continue the game, Karin finally decided. Her voice was cool and level. Archie said they were simply curious. The entire conference lasted only a few seconds, but I had listened carefully and thought I'd caught most of it. I couldn't hear what Ernest asked Edith now with just an intense look. I only saw the slight shake of her head and the look of relief on his face. You catch, Ernest, she said. I'll call it now. She stood right next to me as the others returned to the field, all of their eyes sweeping the forest. Archie and Ernest seemed to orient themselves wherever I stood. I stated the obvious. The others are coming now. Yes, stay very still. Keep quiet and don't move from my side, please. I could hear the stress in her voice, though she tried to hide it. That won't help, Archie murmured. I could smell him across the field. I know, Edith snapped. Karin stood at the plate, and the others joined the game half-heartedly. Uh, what did Ernest ask you? I whispered. She hesitated a second before she answered, whether they were thirsty. The seconds dragged by while the game progressed ap apathetically. No one dared to hit harder than a bunt, and Eleanor and Royal hovered uh, in the infield. Now and again, I was aware of Royal's eyes on me. They were expressionless, but something about the way he held his mouth made me sure he was angry. Edith paid no attention to the game at all, eyes and mind scanning the forest. I'm sorry, Bo. It was stupid, irresponsible to expose you like this. I'm so sorry. I heard her breath stop and her eyes zeroed in on the right field. She took a half step, angling herself between me and what was coming. It made me start to panic like I had before, imagining her between me and Royal. Edith in danger. I was pretty sure whatever was coming now was worse than Royal. Okay, that wasn't so bad, but it took me a lot longer to read than I thought, and I had a late start, mostly, mostly because I had the uh, practice run of a uh, live stream earlier today. Let me know if uh, any of you got caught that, or if uh, YouTube was able to, um, whatchamacallit, save it to uh, my channel so you guys can watch later. I, I just played South Park. I figured, why not, because I was going to be playing anyway. Alright, so we've got like... Let's see. About that much of the book left to go. By the looks of it. Yeah. Yeah, about that much. Uh, let's see. We've got less than 100 pages to go. Let me know if you guys think that I should do a live stream reading of, say, the last two to four chapters or something. And uh, I'll see if I can or not. Or... If you guys would be interested in something else, uh, I'd like to do something, I guess not necessarily big, but, you know, something to uh, commemorate the finishing of this book. Uh, let me know if you'd like me to read the original Twilight also for the channel, and until next time, goodbye everybody. I should have put the Batman mask on.